Well, you guys seem to really enjoy that first Q&A video, so let's do another one. And just as a reminder, I get these questions from our YouTube members and our Patreon supporters, so if you're interested in getting your question in and possibly having it answered in this format, that's how you do it. Let's get to it. All right, first up, we've got a question from Marion. I just found out that Grizzly sells hand planes. Hey, me too. I didn't really know that. Uh, but I've never heard anyone talk about them. Do you have any experience with them, and would you recommend them to someone who uses, let's say, Ryobi tools? I'm not exactly sure what the Ryobi thing has to do with this since they pretty much do power tools, but maybe it's a budgetary comment that you're in a lower budget, this is why you're looking at Grizzly. So let's take a look at the Grizzly planes. Now the one I'm gonna pick on here is the Jack plane. It's one of my favorite planes. 34.95, 34.95 for a Jack plane. That is super cheap. And here's why I say that. Uh, Rockler has uh, the Benchdog brand. Check that out at 199. And then of course, one of the best on the market, you could find at Lee Nielsen for 375. So 34.95, it's probably worth a shot. Just keep in mind, you might need to make some modifications and changes to it. The good thing is there are a lot of videos out there on how to do this. Just tuning up a hand plane is something to search for. There's also a word that sounds like something you should be arrested for. It's called fettling. F-E-T-T-L-I-N-G, look that up and see if you could find ways that you can improve that thing. You might even just be able to improve it by buying a new iron, sometimes replacing the stock iron with something maybe like a hawk iron can be uh, really dramatic in the performance of the tool. So for $34.95, I think it's worth a shot. Give it a try. Next up is Sean. He's asking about coping sleds, getting ready to embark on some face frame and door frame making. Picked up a coping sled already, but wanted to know from you. What are your experiences with a coping sled? What are the features you like or look for? Any plans to do a coping sled shootout? No, probably not. Uh, for your reference, I picked up the Woodpecker's Iron Grip Coping Sled due to the aluminum bottom plate clamp feature and build quality. Well, I don't really do a lot of cope and stick joinery these days. I've used it a few times in my career. I do have one and I'll show it to you. Now, if you're not familiar, this is what a coping sled looks like. This one I think is an old Rockler version. The idea is you're essentially taking your workpiece, typically the rail from a rail and style door, and you're putting a pretty substantial profile and a groove on there at the same time. And it's usually a big honking bit. So you need a secure way to do that as you're pushing it through. And this allows you to stop it from shifting around, you could apply clamping pressure, and it puts your hands in a safe position. So that's what he's talking about. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have any great advice because you can see I don't really use them very often. Now, say what you will about woodpeckers. One thing most of us can agree on is that they typically take an idea and improve on it. So I would have to guess that the coping sled they make is pretty darn good. I don't know that you even need my opinion. As long as it's doing the job for you, you probably made a decent purchase. Next up, we've got Jeff. He says, I made a batch of cutting boards for Christmas this year. After watching your tongue oil video, I finished them with two coats of pure tongue oil, no citrus, and then a top coat of oil beeswax blend. Between the planer and the sanding up to 220, they were but a smooth and looked great at first, but after a couple of weeks have developed some areas of white streaks. Maybe air bubbles, but I'm not sure. Any ideas what might have caused that? Uh, now he offered pictures and I emailed him and said, hey, actually, you know, I would like to see it. And also, um, you know, what did you, how'd you apply it? You know, because sometimes application method does matter. Uh, he replied, he said, the first coat was more of a flooding on as it was getting soaked up really fast. Second coat, 24 hours later, I wiped any excess and then did a light coat the top coat was a few days later done lightly. Now I've got a lot more to say about this. And in fact, I have a video coming out pretty soon that's talking about my application method for applying natural oils like that because I think too much can be a bad thing. And so many of these instruction sets tell you, flood the surface, keep adding more. As long as it's drinking it up, go ahead, add more on there. And I don't think that's really a good way to apply the finish. So that first flood, in some cases, it just absorbs really deep and doesn't really give the material a chance to cure. So what can happen is that oil can then seep back out to the surface where it does cure because now it has access to oxygen. And I think the little marks that he's seeing there, that white stuff, is the oil wax just kind of drying on the surface. So what I would do is probably lightly sand that away, maybe get a little bit of citrus solvent if you have it available, wipe it down if you want to. Um, but I think just that light sanding with a high grit, maybe 320 paper, should calm that stuff down. And I don't think it's really going to come back because once it's cured, it's cured. So that's what I think is going on. But stay tuned for that video coming up soon because I think it's gonna help a lot of people avoid problems. Next is Jeremy. He says, Mark, looking to buy a new Festool 150 EC sander. Do you have a preference on three stroke or five? Thanks and have a good day. Do you guys know the difference between three and five and what he's even talking about? Let's go to the whiteboard. Move it, pine. 
The stroke on a sander simply refers to the action, all right, that actual vibration action. And the scratch pattern is what that action creates on the surface. So let's say we've got something like this. This is, you know, exaggerated, but you get these little curly cues. If you've ever sanded improperly and you look close at the surface, you might see these. And the idea is to make these as close to invisible as possible as you keep going around the surface. And let's look at the three. Three is, uh, as far as I understand, three millimeters. That refers to the distance of that, that little uh, scratch pattern there, right? So the distance between it is three millimeters is fairly tight. On a five millimeter stroke sander, you're gonna have more gaps between them. It's gonna be bigger. And this actually is a little more noticeable to the eye. The tighter the pattern, the harder it is for us to see. And that's really the goal of these scratches is to make them so we can't see them. So as they get bigger, they're a little easier to see. They're also going to cut a little faster. The five millimeter will be a little more aggressive than the three. So if I could only get one, I would get the five. For me, the time saving, the more aggressive sanding is just gonna get sanding done faster. And if you use good quality paper and you take your time with the sanding process, and in some cases I wind up sanding by hand or scraping as the final step anyway, they don't have to worry too much about that scratch pattern. I never even notice it. Um, so if I'm only gonna get one, I'm gonna make it the five. Next up, we got a question from Brass. I'm gonna kind of shorten this one. He said some nice things. He's got a small shop that's in a garage. The wife has an office right above and he's uh, referencing my video that it did on Kill the Reverb and if there's anything he can do to help stop the sound from transferring into his wife's office. Well, like I tried to say in that video that all the sound treatment that you do inside the space really just makes the sound sound better in that space. It's not really gonna prevent all of those other frequencies from getting through the material that just kind of vibrate through. That said, there are probably some things you can do. This is a good thing to search. You probably find tips on Google about this or you know YouTube, um, where for instance, you could put your tools onto rubber mats. Right? If you can stop the vibration of a tool from going directly into the concrete, which then vibrates your walls and goes up and into the ceiling, it's all those points of contact that are connecting each other that let those frequencies travel right on through. So that's one of the biggest things you can do. Now, treating the interior of the space, sure, that might help a little bit of those higher frequencies from traveling through, but ultimately, she's still gonna hear you, right? So look into isolation, that's the key. And making sure the tools are somewhat isolated from the floor they're against or the wall that they're attached to, that's the stuff that's going to kind of help. And there might be other things you can do, but when you look into true soundproofing, it's a whole lot more involved than simply making a few panels and putting them under walls and ceiling. Lewis wrote in, he says, I just received George Nakashima's book, The Soul of a Tree, in the mail. His work and Asian cultures in general have greatly influenced my crafting style. What have been the greatest influences in your woodworking journey? I'm right there with you, Lewis. Um, I think Nakashima's work, and I find a lot of Asian furniture to be very inspiring and seems to find its way in, in some way whether I realize it or not, into my work. Um, many of you probably know that I am heavily influenced by a gentleman named David Marks. Absolutely awesome guy, great furniture maker. I had the great opportunity to work with him for a short period of time. David is fantastic. So if you can go check out his old Woodworks episodes, go to his website and you will not regret it, I promise you. Um, but I've got a lot of influences outside of that, but that's really where the core of it starts. Uh, you know, Green and Green Furniture, uh, the Green Brothers, that's also another big influence. Um, but I could be here all day with the rest of them, but that's a, that's a good place to start. Got one from Jeffrey here. Mark, I'm trying to step up my veneer game and just got a vacuum press. I'm interested in your opinion on the glue. In previous projects I've used, Typon's cold press veneer glue got good results. I did some research and I understand that it is a PVA glue and will have a bit of flexibility when cured. Some suggest using a stiffer glue would be better in cases like larger panels and highly figured grains. They suggest something like urea formaldehyde glue. This sounds pretty nasty, but I'd consider it if the performance is truly better. Well, uh, the good news is yes, the performance is better. The bad news is yes, it's nasty to work with. Um, I've used urea formaldehyde stuff in the past. It is a very, very rigid bond. Think peanut brittle. <laughs> Right? So if the PVA stuff is a little bit more like a taffy, uh, the urea formaldehyde is gonna be more like peanut brittle, where it's a very, very, actually kind of looks the same color too when it's dried, just don't need it. Um, but I don't want that powder in my shop. Even once you get the two-part mixture together and all the dangerous stuff is kind of settled down into a liquid, you're going to be sanding and cutting those parts later, and that will release that stuff into the environment. So it's up to you if you wanna deal with it. Um, I've been using a lot of the PVA varieties, cold press glues, type bonds, is great too. Unibond One is another one you could look into. Um, they work pretty well. I haven't really had any major issues with them and I haven't really had a need to go back to the urea formaldehyde stuff. But that said, if you want the best of the best, 
Unfortunately, I think that's where you have to go. Just make sure you do your research and take the proper safety precautions. Next, we've got a question from Eric. He says, I'm filling gaps in a tabletop with epoxy, only about half to three quarter inch wide, not a river table. The piece is about one and a half inches thick. Wondering if I should pour half first, let it set, then pour the second half separately, or just pour the entire thickness at once. I have the fast hardener in an unheated garage, averages about 40 this time of year in Pittsburgh. Oh, what would you do? Well, this one's a little bit, you gotta be careful with that temperature. Um, they do have recommended working temperatures for epoxy. Maybe it depends on the brand, but usually it's like 40 to 50 degrees. So just be aware of that, that that could potentially cause a problem for you. Uh, that said, the thickness, one and a half inches, I would do that in one pour for me personally. I usually use West System Epoxy. I have no problem with uh, pours of that thickness. Um, I barely have enough patience to do this process in the first place, let alone do it in two passes. <laughs> so I would definitely do that. If you have a heat gun, not a bad idea to kind of heat the material as it goes into your whatever flaw you're filling or not. Uh, this way you have a good assurance that it's gonna absorb pretty deeply and also drive some of those air bubbles out. But for sure, at an inch and a half, I would just fill the whole thing. And Next, we've got Alex, the meme machine. He says, lately I've been trying some different things with general air filtration in my shop and lumber storage area. I do have eczema, so I try to keep my skin covered to reduce irritation from any sawdust, uh, especially when moving rough sawn lumber. Do you think those with similar conditions, especially those sensitive to aromatic woods, would see any meaningful difference from using carbon activated type filters for eliminating odors? I know an easy way to handle this would be to open doors for fresh air to circulate, but I'm in a basement shop without that that option. You know, I would do that anyway, dude. You're probably finishing down there. It would not hurt to have some kind of carbon filtration in there, as well as the standard, like, you know, particulate filtration that comes with the, uh, the, the fabric type materials. So yes, I would add that. Do I know for sure that that's going to be super helpful to people with sensitive skin and skin conditions? I'm not a doctor, although I played one on TV once. I do um, think that it probably could help. So I'm going to go with a yes on that. But you know what? A lot of people, and maybe even doctors, watch these videos if you have some thoughts on this let Alex know if that's something that could help but just in general some kind of a carbon filtration in uh, in your shop is probably a good idea anyway in fact I'm gonna go to Amazon and buy one right now. And my buddy Tommaso has the last question today. He says, you have had a CNC and a Shaper Origin. How much are you using them for non-production work and how are you liking them? Do you see them as neat novelties or mission critical? Definitely not mission critical for me. I do see them as a bit of a novelty um, only because of my own limiting the situation. I love like classic woodworking, right? That's the stuff that I was brought up on that I really enjoy doing. CNC is something that I have tons of respect for and I'm learning as time goes on, I'm learning more about it. The Shaper Origin is an incredible game-changing tool for a lot of people and having a standard CNC, I still think is very valuable. Um, if I had one today, I don't have one right now, but I do plan to get one, um, I'd be cutting a lot of templates. But the funny thing is I'll use the CNC to cut a big template that I find difficult to make by hand. I'll Cut that template and then I'll use my router with a flush trim bit and I'll cut that edge when all I really needed to do was take that same program and that same cut path and do that on my actual workpiece instead of making the template. Um, but it just, it really facilitates the style of woodworking that I like to do. And the longer I use it, the more I'm gonna probably incorporate it into my work, but it's just not a huge priority for me to incorporate it into my work because I do the kind of woodworking that I love to do, right? So I'll dip into CNC and using the Shaper Origin as time permits and as my interest permits. Outside of that, I don't really use them that much. That's just me. They're all great tools. And if you're interested in it, dude, definitely jump into it. That origin is pretty awesome. All right, so that's all I got for you today. Thanks as always for watching and I appreciate the support on videos like this. Definitely not our usual stuff, a little bit different, but I hope you guys like it. It's kind of just a quick burst of information and sort of it's its own thing, right? So thank you again. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you next time. And check out my new shoes. I really want people to see me from a mile away.